All right, what I want to talk to you today is about what you believe about your marriage. What you believe about your marriage. Because what you believe about your marriage is the single most powerful influence in your marriage. Everything we do is based on what we believe. And so how we react, the words we use, the tone of our voice, our actions, they all come out of what we believe about our marriage. And usually, um, those beliefs come to us from our parents. They come to us from our culture. Uh, and if our parents and friends have healthy marriages, um, then we'll most likely have a healthy view of marriage. We'll most likely see marriage in a good light. But um, like in my case, my mom and my dad, you know, their uh, marriage ended in divorce. And uh, they were divorced the first year, actually, that Roxy and I were, were married. Um, and so uh, you can imagine if, if it ended in divorce, there were probably a lot of years where the marriage wasn't good. You know, and that's the model that I had. My wife, you know, her family um, was impacted by mental illness that was in the family. Her dad had a mental illness. Her sister was mentally ill. And so her home was always chaotic and filled with, um, with uh, just distress. Um, her dad would, you know, was, uh, would leave. Uh, for, and even though she loved her dad, you know, there was a lot of uh, a lot of unhealthy things in her life growing up. So you can imagine two people with a broken view of marriage coming together as one flesh. Um, that was a recipe for excitement. <laughs> you know, as I like to say, we, we never fight. We just have intense times of fellowship. Um, and oftentimes those intense times of fellowship are heard by our, na by our neighbors, you know. <laughs> and so we both came from homes that were, uh, were, we didn't talk in our homes. You know, communication didn't happen. Uh, there was unhealthy communication when it did happen. And so uh, those things have always been painful for us. You know, they've been difficult for us. And so what Rox and I learned is that the key to changing our marriage is that we had to change our minds about our marriage. We had to change our beliefs about marriages, marriage, and as we began to change our beliefs about marriage, our marriage began to, began to change. And of course, the belief that we came to is to decide that we were going to base our marriage solely on the scriptures, solely on God's word. We were going to approach it from the biblical standpoint. So by changing the core beliefs of my heart, I can experience victory over worry, judging others, irritations, lust, anger, complaining, and disharmony in my marriage that leads to ingratitude and unthankfulness that can creep into marriage. You know, I love that definition that marriage, you know, separation is just leaving room, allowing there to be room for something else to come in between. You know, Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And out of Proverbs 23.7, it says, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. And so it's not just what you say, it's what you think. Because oftentimes what's in the heart could be different. The beliefs that are embedded in our hearts controls everything about you. And the reality is, is most of us aren't really aware of what we do and don't believe. You know, they're so deeply ingrained inside of us. And so we haven't identified them and uh, the core beliefs that, uh, that basically have an impact on our lives. And so... What I want to look at are four principles that are to govern our marriages that will change how you see your marriage, that will change what you believe about your marriage, and that will bring health and wholeness into your marriage. You know, the Bible tells us that we don't have to conform to the unhealthy beliefs we've learned, but we can be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That's what Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, do not be conformed, but be transformed. And so transformation is powerful, is, 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 uh, is available to us 
and it will change us. And so the first key principle is found in Matthew 6.21. And it's simply this. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And the, the first principle is simply this. You love what you value. Whatever you value, that's what you love. Whatever value you value, that is what you're going to invest your time into. That's what you're going to invest your resources into. That's what you're going to invest your money into. You know, and if something loses its value to us, okay, if something loses its value to us over time, we can lose our love for that thing. Over time, we can lose our love for that thing. So, and this can happen slowly without you even noticing it. Marriage was designed to exist in an atmosphere of love. And as Pastor Barry Stagner was sharing with us, those things that we simply do, that we kiss our wife every morning. You know, he brings his wife coffee every morning. I would love to bring my wife coffee every morning. Um, she's a coffee snob. And uh, so she doesn't like the coffee that I bring. Uh, she's, uh, she's very particular about it. Uh, it takes her like 10 minutes to order something from Starbucks because she has all these questions about you know, what, what kind of coffee and all that stuff. And that's who she is, you know. But there are routines, things that we do in order to maintain the value of our relationship, that our relationship doesn't lose value. So if we love what we value, um, how do we increase the value of that? You know, one of the things that I often discover as I'm counseling couples is that at some point in time in their relationship, they stopped doing the things that show they valued that relationship. You know, and maybe it was as simple as opening a door. And maybe for you, that's a, a beginning spot. And maybe you spent time together and now life has overwhelmed you and you don't spend time, you know, together anymore. And those things communicate that you don't value something. Well, here's the thing. You can change that today. You can change that today. And the primary way that we increase value, as um, John Miller said, is through gratitude. By thanking God for your husband and for your wife. Colossians 3.15 says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Be thankful. 2 Th uh, Thessalonians 2.13 says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And so this thanksgiving that we're to have is to be personally, it's to be personally directed to someone. And in the context of marriage, we are to direct our thanksgiving to our husband and our wife. Are you thankful for your husband and your wife? And do you express that thankfulness, that gratitude to God regularly? And do you express that gratitude to them regularly? Or do you just kind of expect it? I remember in our first um, year of marriage, now my mom, she's awesome. And she would, you know, wash my clothes. She would iron my clothes. I mean, she was just incredible. And my, I would just walk into my closet and magically everything was there. And I remember, you know, I came home and Roxy had a pile of laundry and she says, that's it, I'm never ironing your clothes again. I said, you can't not do that. My mom ironed my clothes my whole life. She says, I'm not your mom, I'm your wife. Praise God for dry cleaning. And, um, <laughs> but I had taken for granted. I was taking for granted and being ungrateful to my wife, and rather than being a blessing to her, I was a burden. You know, I didn't, I wasn't grateful for the things that she was doing, even the simple things. And the thing that happens is you begin to thank God for your husband, as you begin to thank God for your wife, your sense of value in them begins to increase. Your value of them increases. And when you express it to them personally, it increases even more. 
Now, you might say, how can I be thankful for my husband and my wife when they drive me nuts? You know, they're the source of my problems. How can I be thankful for them? Well, something that I've noticed, and maybe you've noticed this too, is that you tend to be irritated in someone else what you're irritated about yourself. Do you find that to be true? You know, what really bothers you about someone else is something that really bothers you about yourself. And Jesus said, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? And so when your husband or your wife really irritates you, they're actually doing you a favor because they're pointing out the plank that is in your eye. They're pointing out the thing in you that the Lord really wants to minister to. And so you actually owe them a debt of gratitude for doing that for you because they're actually in that moment being used by the Holy Spirit in your life. And so that thing that really irritates you, you should just get down and say, Lord, I thank you for showing me that area of my life where I need you to work. And thank you for using my husband or my wife to do that. Because it w if it wasn't for them, you'd have no reason to grow in your relationship with God. The second and more obvious thing from our text here that we can do to increase value is to spend more time, more energy, more money on your husband or your wife. And I'm not talking about in general, but just personally. You know, a lot of times guys think, hey, honey, I bought us a lawnmower. It's awesome. <laughs> for you. I know how you like to lawn, mow the lawn, and I want to make it easier for you. You know, I used to buy my wife appliances, you know, for Christmas. It's like, look at this nice vacuum cleaner I got you, honey. It's like, that's just, a, that's just that's like a slave sentence or something, you know? <laughs> no, she wanted me to value her, not what I get out of her, not what she does for me. She wanted me to value her personally. You know, I love that illustration that, uh, that Barry used, you know, like, do you know what your wife's favorite flowers are, you know? And, 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 it's, and the husband says, yeah, it's, it's Pillsbury, right? But that's how a lot of guys are. We really don't know because we haven't <clears throat> taken the time to find out what blesses our wives. Because we're not spending time. We're not spending money. We're not spending our resources on them. And that's something that, that I've you know, adjusted in our marriage to let her know that I value her literally by taking what's important to me and sharing it with her or giving it to her, you know. Here's a second principle. Every trial has a hidden treasure. Every trial has a hidden treasure. In Romans 8, 28 through 30, it says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. There's a Christian author and speaker by the name of Barbara Johnson, and she used to say, pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. You know, Jesus said, in this world, we're going to have tribulation, and this world is going to be difficult, but we're to be of good cheer because he has overcome the world. And so everything negative that has come my way, bad times, difficult relationship, hardships, pain, discomfort, disappointments, discouragements, irritations, and all other uncomfortable circumstances are really camouflages for great gifts. And those gifts are not easily seen. They need to be discovered. They need to be discovered. And one treasure we can uncover through all of these difficulties 
is a stronger, more Christ-like character. The ability to love our wives, the ability to care for our wives, to respect our husbands, even when it's difficult, that takes the power of Jesus Christ in a marriage. And we learn that through difficulty. My son is uh, mentally ill, and in one of the, his hospitalizations, we went to um, visit him. And we found him inside, and he was just sharing Jesus with everyone. You know, he's sharing the Lord. He's praying for them. He's reading them Bible. He's quoting them scriptures. And, um, and he's, he's just pouring into these people that, that, you know, we would never, ever have the opportunity to do that with. And it was in a time when we're struggling, you know, God, how is this possible? Why is this us? And, and all the difficulty that goes along with us. And when my wife saw that, it was like the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, you know, if, if this is what his purpose in life is, is to reach these people, and in order to reach him, he had to become one of them. Doesn't that sound familiar in Scripture? If that's what it took, then we're grateful. We're thankful. It was a game changer in our brain, in our thinking. James 1, 2 through 4 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And so how do we discover this hidden treasure of the things that we're going through that we don't understand? We discover it through prayer, through spending time with Jesus, through spending time with the Lord. To ask him, God, show me what are you working in me in this marriage? What are you doing in my life, in my heart? What are you doing in our children's lives? What are you doing in my wife's life? Show me, Lord, what you are doing and the character that you're producing in me because of this. Open my eyes to see it. And what you'll discover is that God is more interested in your holiness than he is your happiness. He's more interested in you becoming like him. And I can honestly say thank you to Roxy because she helps me to grow in my relationship with Jesus because I'm always in prayer. <laughs> you know? I'm always seeking the Lord. Help me to be wiser as a husband. Help me to be more kind. Help me to understand my wife. Live with my wife with understanding. Help me not to let anything get in between our relationship. Help me to plug the gaps. The third principle is this. Daily forgiveness brings freedom. Matthew 6, 14 through 15 says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men your trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And in Ephesians 4, 26 through 27, Paul writes, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. And when you don't forgive, two things happen. One, you give an open door, a space for the enemy to come into your marriage. You open the door wide. The second thing that happens is that you become hurt by your unforgiveness because you become trapped by your anger. And that anger over time becomes a root of bitterness that later the Holy Spirit has to pull out. You know, anger is the root cause of anxiety, depression, tension, worry, and it can lead to all kinds of mental health and relational disorders when it's not treated appropriately, when it's left to fester. You know, anger is not necessarily bad. You know, the Bible says, be angry and don't sin. And so it's possible that, you know, you can have anger and not sin. And, and what I tell people is that anger is really a symptom of, a, of that we've been violated. There's something that we believe that has been a line that's been crossed and, and that upsets us. You know, if you cross that line, anger rises in self-defense. You know, someone has stepped over the boundaries we place around ourselves to protect our rights, our property, our desires, our feelings, or whatever we value. 
And that sense of justice in me says, no one can treat me that way and get away with it. Right? That's what anger does. But the danger with anger, justified or not, is that it is corrosive in us. It's a deadly acid in our hearts. And when we don't deal with it appropriately and forgive, it leads us to become cynical, bitter, distrustful, uncaring about the feelings and well-beings of others. Anger destroys relationships, and destroyed relationships close us off from love. And if you can't receive even God's love because you're angry, you're allowing that anger to destroy your marriage. And so, guys, it's so important. Every day, at the end of the day, you need to clear your heart. At the end of the day, don't sleep on it. Deal with it. That means if you've got to stay up till 1 or 2 in the morning talking about it, you stay up till 1 or 2 in the morning talking about it. You deal with it. And you're saying, well, I'm too tired, I'm too old to do that. Well, then you'll learn better to deal with it earlier. Start at five and, you know, <laughs> don't wait till midnight to deal with it. But don't let the sun go down without dealing with that anger, without bringing forgiveness and restoring relationship. 1 John 4, 20 through 21 says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must also love his brother. And so harboring anger over long periods of time will actually destroy all happiness and joy in your heart because it is corrosive. And so if you're unhappy today in your marriage, if that's really where you're at, your first step to restoration is to forgive. That's your first step, to forgive. That is how we clean our hearts and get rid of anger. In Colossians 3, 12 through 13, it says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. You know, forgiveness heals wounded hearts, both that of the forgiver and the forgiven. And forgiveness is the valve that releases bitterness and anger and resentment. And if your heart is closed and hardened because of something your, heart, your husband or wife has done, then you need to forgive. You need to forgive. Now, how do you forgive? How do you forgive? And a, a, a definition for, give, for forgiveness that someone told me recently that I, that I really like is that forgiveness is simply surrendering back to God the right and the authority to judge. That's what it is. Because when you're unforgiving, you're the judge. I'm judging you, you're guilty, and I'm not going to forgive you. But you see, in Corinthians, the Bible tells us that God is the judge of all men. I'm not the judge. He's the judge. And so if he's the judge, in order for me to forgive, I need to give that judgment back to him. And I need, I need to say, okay, concerning my husband, concerning what he's done, concerning my wife, concerning what she's done, God, I'm going to give back to you, surrender back to you the right and the authority to judge. You judge him or her however you desire, and I will support your judgment. And then you let it go, and you let God work. You let God work in that situation. And here's what you're going to find out when you do that. One, you'll be free. You'll be free. But secondly, God is going to set that person free. And you might not like it. You might not like the, the way God goes about it. But you're going to like the effects of it when he's done with it. You know, because that thing of justice in us is pretty strong. We feel like someone's got to pay. But here's the thing. Someone did pay. Jesus paid on the cross. Not just for your sins, but the sins that were done against you. And he has forgiven Everything. You know, earlier today in worship, I, I was just quieting my heart, and I just saw a picture of Jesus going through every role 
and coming up to different couples and just unlocking shackles and having those shackles fall off. And he told me two things. He said um, about the women, he said, he said that there are women here that are, their hearts are resentful to their husbands for what they've done to them. God wants you to forgive. The other thing is that there are women that are filled with fear because they're afraid for their future because they don't see their husband rising up and being the man that God has called them to be. And the Lord says, you need to release your husband into his hands. You need to let him do the work. You're not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. And he showed me something about the men, that there are, are men here, and you've been, um, you have not maintained your sexual integrity. And you need to surrender that to the Lord Jesus Christ and not bow to an idol. We don't worship a false god. We worship one god. And he showed me how as you begin to do that, as you begin to release your marriage to the Lord, that he is going to strengthen and restore and heal your marriage and give you a marriage that you never dreamed you could have. The fourth principle that kind of goes along with this is my husband or wife does not cause my unhappiness. Let me read that again because I didn't hear an amen. Um, <laughs> my husband or wife does not cause my unhappiness. Well, you don't have to say amen. <laughs> James says in chapter 4, verse 1, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires or pleasures that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. And he says in verse 6, But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so my beliefs, my unfilled desires determine whether I'm happy or not. That's what I oftentimes base my happiness on. And when I'm unhappy in my marriage, I'm reacting to, this, to the unfulfilled desires, these things that I believed that were supposed to happen in my marriage, and I'm looking to my husband or my wife to fulfill them. And I'm also reacting to this false belief that God doesn't really love me or that he's unable to care for me. And when I don't believe that God loves me or that he cares for me, it brings me to a place where I begin to put that load, that burden on my husband or wife to fulfill what only God can fulfill in my life. And I become frustrated and unhappy. What brings me to a place of rest and true happiness is even in a difficult mar marriage is when I believe that I am loved by God. And I get what I need from him. And him alone. The truth is, I cannot change my husband or my wife. Something we used to say uh, when we were touring with uh, Maranatha Music is, is we would, the, one of the guys would, would come up and he says, well, you know, people change, but not much. You know, and, and the person that you married, they're the same person. They just have more real estate than they did back then. You know, they're the same people. The thing that irritated you back then, it hasn't gone away. It's probably gotten worse. The thing that you loved is still there. They're the same people. But oftentimes my expectations, because we go into marriage with expectations, we think that, oh, well, over time they're going to grow and they're going to change. Or over time, this expectation is, is going to somehow be fulfilled. They were a boy, now they're going to become a man. They're a girl, they're become a woman. And all my dreams are going to be fulfilled. And we maintain these expectations and go into a, a marriage unrealistically. And if I try to change my husband or my wife, I create an unsafe place for him or her that will force me 
and force us to drift further apart. It allows space to come into our relationship. And if I want to create a safe environment for my husband or wife to grow and thrive, I need to stop getting on their case and judging them. I need to stop badgering them. God's love is what's to make my home the safest place on earth. And if I build my home on God's love, it creates the perfect environment for growth. We were a couple, uh, counseling a couple recently and, 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 and really just unfolding these very principles for them. And, you know, and so you know, the wife wants total transparency. I want to know what you're doing and, and who you're doing it with. So the husband's like, okay, I'll do it. So so calls up, what are you doing? I'm doing this. Who are you doing with? I'm doing it with this person. Well, why are you doing that for? That's terrible. Don't do that ever again. So after two or three times of that, the husband started saying, well, I'm just going to McDonald's. He started lying. Why? Because he's doing what she asked her to do, but every time she, he does it, he gets yelled at. And so he says, it's easier for me just to lie and tell her I'm somewhere else than to go through all of that. And so we sat them down and we said, we need to create an environment built on the love of God. If you ask him to call you, don't yell at him for what he's doing. Now, he wasn't doing anything. I'm not talking about sinfulness, okay? Don't get me wrong. If your husband is, you know, you call him, you're like, I'm at the bar with the boys, like, you yell at him. <laughs> You say, get out of that bar right now. You get home. Peaceful, forgiving, merciful, gracious, compassionate, tender. Those are the words that are listed in 1 Corinthians 13 for God's love. If I don't believe God is my main source of love in life and that there is a hidden treasure in every trial, then I will put a tremendous burden on my husband or wife to be my source of love, my source of life, and my source of happiness. But by changing my beliefs, not only do I free my spouse from this heavy burden, but I free myself from living under the tyranny of trying to change my husband or wife by complaining about them or judging them or accusing them of all the ways that they fail me. I mean, who wants to live under that? Do you? No one likes to live under that kind of an environment. Now, you might say, well, but what if there's a real problem? Well, God has given us a way to deal with real problems in Matthew 18, hasn't he? You go to them. You talk to them. Privately. If it doesn't work, then you bring a friend. And if that doesn't work, then you call Pastor David. You don't have a problem, and then call Pastor David. A lot of couples do that. Because oftentimes you put the pastor in a position where you're using them to manipulate what you want to get out of it instead of really bringing healing and reconciliation in your marriage. And so God has given us a way to deal with it so that we protect one another, we maintain the integrity of our relationship, we cover for one another because love covers. It doesn't ignore. It deals with it. But you go through the steps. And if it doesn't change, then you call Pastor David. He loves to talk to people like that. And a benefit of changing my beliefs is that I receive the freedom to receive love. James 5, 9 says, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And he says in 4.10, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. And so as I begin to change my way of thinking about my marriage, and I begin to put into practice these principles, not only am I free from condemnation, but I'm free to receive God's blessing in my life. God, the judge isn't standing at the door. He's here to lift me up and to lift up my marriage. Many of us enter into marriage with all the wrong belief that our mate should be the source of our satisfaction. And we think now that I have this person in my life, I'm really going to have all my needs met and be happy. And when disappointment comes, many people think they've married the wrong person. 
And so they think, well, the answer then is I can find a better person. But the statistics show that when you go into an affair, your next marriage has a, 30, uh, a 50% chance of failing. More higher of failure rate. And the more partners you have, the higher that goes up. It's never in your favor. The problem is not the person you've married. It's the wrong belief that the person will make you happy and keep you fulfilled. And the bottom line is we're not designed to find our ultimate fulfillment in each other. We were designed to find our fulfillment in God. And Deuteronomy 6.5 says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Gary Smalley says it like this, as wonderful and delightful as the relationship between the sexes can be, Eve was not given to Adam as a substitute for God. He designed us to be in love with him first and to obey his will, which was designed to lead us to life. And then from the overflow of that love, he gives us the power to love others. So when we take a mate, we simply extend our love for God to include another person in our life. And when you open yourself to be filled by God, you draw your mate within your love for God. See, it begins with your relationship with the Lord. And really what I believe that, that if you were to be honest with where you're at with your marriage, and the difficulties you're facing, you would have to admit that really your relationship with the Lord has not been going well. You would have to admit that. You'd have to say, you know what? I'm not really loving as God says to love. I'm not really loving my wife. I'm not really laying down my life. I'm not really respecting my husband. I'm not really obeying the word of the Lord as God has outlined it. And so really, for us, the beginning point is with God. It's to make a decision that I'm going to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I'm going to surrender my thoughts, my mind, my will, my expectations, my ambitions, my whatever it is that you're holding on to, I'm going to surrender it all to Jesus Christ right now. And from that place of surrender, I'm going to look at my husband and my wife, and I'm going to forgive them. Lord, you've forgiven me of so much. How can I hold anything against someone else? Three things that we can do to get back to our first love. It's simple. The first is just simply to remember. You remember what you used to do? You remember the long phone calls? Well, some of you remember when you used to write letters. Now we send texts, pictures. But you remember what you used to do when you were trying to win their affection? The second thing he says in Revelation is repent, which means to change your thinking. Stop thinking about your marriage the way you've been thinking about it. Think differently. Think biblically. This is a person I value. I'm going to treasure them. And then it says, go back and do the first things. Go back and do what you used to do. Go back and make time in your schedule. Let me tell you guys, if that means you're busy because of your business, take an early day. My business will suffer. I can't pay my bills. You know what? Let me tell you something. Your wife leaves, you won't be able to pay your bills either. Invest in your marriage. Go back and do the things you used to do. And watch God work a miracle. And you know what? You can do that even if your marriage is great. 
and it'll make even a more stronger, solid relationship. Yeah.